However hard you try to get the right plants for your zone, for your area, for your climate, for your soil, the weather can come along and just throw everything out the window. So I've chosen five resilient flowers from my garden and I've checked them out with horticultural organisations and plant sellers to make sure that they're not just resilient in my garden but that they'll be resilient in your garden. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and I'll put the names of the flowers and any resources I mention in the description below along with timestamps so you can jump to whichever part of the video you'd like to see. If you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with free videos with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap the subscribe button and if you'd like YouTube to tell you when a new video is uploaded, tap the notifications bell. So these five flowers are not just resilient across a wide range of weather zones. They're also good in a wide range of soils. They're pretty pest and disease free and some of them are even flexible about whether they need full sun or partial shade. Plus, at the end of this post, I've added two extra plants which do look beautiful in my garden and which may be brilliant for your garden, but can come with a bit of a hazard warning. An American once said, apparently, you British don't have weather, you just have samples. So we do have a very much milder climate than in many parts of the world. Our summers are not as hot, our winters are not as cold, and our rain is really not as frequent as everyone would have you believe. But this summer has been very different. We've had twice as much rainfall as usual. We've had cooler temperatures and we've had a lot of wind. So it's bashed all the flowers in the garden to bits. Things are toppling over, things are balled up, things are mildewed. They're not looking great. So this is why these five resilient flowers have been so important in my garden and I think they could be very useful in yours. Number one, the oak leaf hydrangea the most resilient of the hydrangeas. Although hydrangeas are reasonably resilient plants, I've found that many of them do droop in a drought, so I've had to water them. And I would prefer not to have to water plants on a regular basis. All plants will need watering their first summer after planting, but after that, it's much better if they can be left alone. It saves you time and it saves water. 11 years ago, I planted an oak leaf hydrangea in this corner of the garden, under a tree and beside a wall, and I knew very little about gardening at the time. Otherwise, I would have realized that that's just about the most difficult spot for a plant. It's too far away for the hose, so I've never watered it. I don't prune it, it only needs light pruning anyway, and I've never fed it, and it just sits there looking beautiful. Most hydrangeas really need partial shade but this the oak leaf hydrangea can deal with full sun and the RHS says it can be planted in north facing south facing east facing and west facing positions it's also widely quoted as being rabbit resistant however Rosie Hardy of Hardy's Cottage Garden Plants did a video with me on perennials made simple which I'll put in the description below and she said that really pretty much any plant can be eaten by a very determined deer or rabbit however I think that rabbit resistant can be taken to mean the rabbits would prefer to eat something else and will only eat your oak leaf hydrangeas if they're very hungry Oak leaf hydrangeas come from the United States where they're hardy from zones 5 to 9, which means they can be grown all over the UK and Europe, and they're not quoted as invasive in any of those zones. Next flower, Cosmos, one of the most resilient annuals. I've grown Cosmos pretty much every year, and it's always come up trumps no matter what the summer. Cosmos comes in pink, red, white and even yellow, and I think there are some orange ones now as well. It's an annual, which means that it doesn't matter too much how it withstands winter because you grow it from seed at the beginning of the season, it flowers, it dies and then the plant is over and you grow it again from seed the following season. However, it is considered hardy in a very wide range of US zones and also all over UK, Northern Europe and Australia. If you keep deadheading cosmos, snipping off the dead and dying flowers, you will have months of colour. Mine usually flower from about high summer right until the first frosts. Cosmos does prefer full sun. I have grown it in my east facing border, but it struggled and strained to reach the light. And all the horticultural associations and plant sellers that I looked up online did say Cosmos must have full sun. But there was not such agreement on whether it needed to have quite a poor soil. It certainly does well in poor soils, but actually I've got reasonably rich soil. So I think in terms of soil type, you can try Cosmos almost anywhere. Cosmos is loved by pollinators. 
A few people have problems with Cosmos self-seeding itself, but on the whole it's not listed as invasive in many places in the world, although there are a couple of states in the United States, so just check where you live. Next plant, Nepeta, otherwise known as catmint. When I first started gardening, a friend suggested that I grow Nepeta rather than lavender. I think he could see that I knew very little and needed really resilient plants. And it has to be said that lavender is not considered a fussy plant. You'll often find it on lists of resilient plants. The only thing is that it really hates cold, wet soil. So it can struggle if you have cold, wet winters. Nepeta, however, is completely different. It gives you about four months of flowers and the flowers can be white, blue or pink. There'll be about two months of flowers in the first flush, then cut it back and then you'll usually get a second flush. Pollinators love it. And according to Claire Austin Hardy Plants, it's also rabbit resistant, which I think once again we can take as only a very hungry rabbit will go for it. A friend of mine was dividing some Nepeta and asked me if I wanted some, so she dropped it off in my front garden and I forgot about it, whereupon it took root. So Nepeta is so easy care that you barely even have to plant it. There is some debate as to whether it's a good companion for roses, however, because you will see it recommended on quite a few sites as a companion for roses. But when I asked Michael Marriott of David Austin Roses as to whether Nepeta was a good companion for roses, he advised against it because he said it's a very vigorous plant and roses really don't like competition. Many sites also recommended growing Nepeta in full sun, but my Nepeta has been in full sun and partial shade, and other sites also agreed with that. So I would say once again, see how it goes in your garden. If you want to know more about the different kinds of shade in your garden and choosing plants for shade, I've got a video on that in the description below. Next plant, globe thistle, loved by pollinators. Globe thistle is a member of the thistle family and thistles are considered weeds and much too aggressive for many parts of the world. However, globe thistle, Echinops ritro is its botanical name, is considered a good garden plant and I couldn't find many warnings against it. It even has an RHS award of garden merit. I've got two clumps of globe thistle. One is in full sun and the other is in an east facing border where I have struggled to grow some plants and it is vigorous in both of those. One thing that slightly surprised me though, is in looking up globe thistle on lots and lots of websites, was that it said it grows to two to four feet and mine is most definitely nearer six feet. White globe thistle grows to six feet, but mine isn't white. Well, I think that's just perhaps one of those baffling things about labeling. Globe thistle can be grown in US hardiness zones, three to 10, and anywhere in the UK and Northern Europe and the Diggers Club of Australia also recommend it for quite a wide variety of zones in Australia, adding that it's very drought resistant once established. One thing to remember about drought resistant plants is that the first summer you plant them, they do usually need watering because they need a chance to get their roots down. But it's a really good idea to have plants in your garden that don't need watering after their first year. Next plant, roses, because they will be one for you. I really dithered about including roses on my list of resilient plants because of course a lot of roses the flowers sort of ball up and look sort of withered when it rains and certainly some of my roses have not done well in this rain but others have and there's such a wide variety of roses that you can probably find one that will work wherever you are. In this garden Rosa Bonica in the front garden has just ignored the weather it looks good whatever and quite a few rose growers do actually list their roses according to situation. The wild rose, Rosa rugosa, is also very resilient and grows in a wide variety of zones. However, here in the UK, it's considered invasive if you live near the coast. It's on something called the Schedule 9 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which means it's not illegal to sell it and it's not illegal to plant it, but it is illegal to allow it to escape from your garden out into a coastal area and when you think that birds come along and then they take the rose hips and then they fly off and then they drop the seeds elsewhere it is rather difficult to see how we can prevent it from escaping from our gardens. This brings me to the two plants which can look beautiful in your garden and will certainly withstand anything the weather can throw at them but which do come with a bit of a warning. The problem with invasive plants 
is that when they escape out into the countryside and spread, they outcompete the plants that were growing there originally. And therefore, the insects and the algae and the mosses and all the little kind of organisms that relied on those plants start to die off. So all the wildlife that lives on the original plants also struggles and starts to die off. And then the wildlife that lives off that wildlife then starts to find life difficult. So the chain goes up and on. Certainly in the United States, Canada and Australia, they're very, very clear about biosecurity and the issue of whether something is invasive in a particular zone or country is really addressed. There are lists, you can look them up and it's quite easy to find out what's invasive where you are. In Britain, we have the UK Wildlife and Countryside Act with Schedule 9 on it, but it doesn't seem to me that it's particularly well policed. So I think the responsibility really is, when you're choosing a plant, just check to see if it's invasive where you are. Now my first thug plant, as it's called, is bear's breeches or acanthus mollis, and these are these lovely spikes. It is considered to spread, it's not defined as invasive in many parts of the world, but it is a spreader, and if you put it in your garden, you will have real trouble if you want to dig it out. It's a very distinctive sculptural shape. Now the way I've got round loving Acanthus mollis but not loving the way it spreads is to choose a variant that doesn't spread so easily. And that's the white Rue Ledan variant, which you can see here. It's a pure white variant, it's not as invasive, and it, I bought it from Sarah Raven. The next plant that may look gorgeous in your garden but does come with a bit of a hazard warning is Japanese anemones. It's hardy in USDA zones four to nine throughout Northern Europe, United Kingdom and Southern Australia. So it's got a wide range of places it can grow and it's very drought tolerant and it's resilient and it does well in shade. So what more could you ask? The main problem is that if you've got it in your garden and then you want to get rid of it, it often is extremely difficult to get rid of. I have a clump of pink Japanese anemones and about seven or eight years ago I decided to reorganise that border and I got a professional gardener to dig up the Japanese anemones but they were back almost in the same amount of volume literally the next summer and they competed and crowded out the plants that I had planted. And then I forgot about that and about five years later I tried to do the same thing again and exactly the same thing happened. So they are really difficult to get rid of if you do want to get rid of them. And they can spread. They haven't spread extensively in this garden, but they can spread. However, we are quite a dry part of the United Kingdom and they do survive that very well. So I looked online to see what the horticultural associations and the plant sellers said about Japanese anemones. And indeed, the first one I came across said it thrives in shade and it withstands drought very well. But then in the next paragraph, it said plant in moist soil. And when I checked some of the other websites and sellers, quite a few of them said plant in moist soil, although the Diggers Club of Australia said it copes with drought well and naturally Australia does know quite a lot about drought. I think the answer to this apparent contradiction is that you do need to keep Japanese anemones well watered when you first plant them. I've certainly tried to plant them in this garden and not had success with them taking because I wanted to put some lovely white ones in. But they are very pretty and delicate. They come out towards the end of the summer and they go on really until autumn and some people like their seed heads in the winter. I don't water them or fertilise them and yet they just come back and they are very pretty. So I think they're worth considering and you can get them in pinks and white and you can also get sort of frillier versions. They're not actually considered invasive anywhere as far as I could see except for Hawaii. So if you've got any particular resilient flowers that you've found work well in your garden, do leave it in the comments below and check the comments below because they're often a really good resource. And if you'd like more about Beautiful Borders, check out our Beautiful Borders playlist at the end of this video and thank you for watching. Goodbye.